Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients needed for optimal function. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line that closes the modern nutrient gap so you can feel and perform your best. Unlike most supplements that contain cheap synthetic compounds your body can't absorb, we use clinician-grade bioavailable ingredients that make a real and noticeable difference. I've translated 15 years of experience treating hundreds of patients and training over 3,000 healthcare providers into a supplement line you can trust. No BS or hype, just high quality, research-backed, clinically validated products that get results. Our supplements are made without gluten or GMOs. They're also third-party tested to validate ingredients and confirm they're free of heavy metals and other toxins. We have a full range of products from the most advanced multivitamin and phytonutrient formula on the market to a blend of eight organic superfood mushrooms, including reishi chaga and cordyceps, to a one-of-a-kind fish oil with bioavailable forms of curcumin and black seed oil. Our newest product is Luminous Mind, a blend of seven nootropic compounds that boost cognitive function and elevate mood, including citicoline, UMP, bacopa, ginkgo, and lion's mane mushroom. These nootropic ingredients improve focus, memory, and attention, boost motivation and mood, and promote emotional and psychological resilience. They do this without the jitteriness, agitation, and sleep disturbances that often accompany caffeine. They also support brain health by protecting neurons, promoting neuroplasticity, and even regenerating new brain cells. Luminous Minds are perfect fit for students, knowledge workers, entrepreneurs, creators, artists, people under mental or emotional stress, and those struggling with cognitive issues, low mood, and difficulty focusing and concentrating. I think of it as an unfair advantage that can help you achieve your goals, whatever they may be. Head to adaptnaturals.com to learn more and start living the life you want to live. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. We live in the era of precision medicine with many exciting innovations in diagnosis and treatment, yet in many ways, cancer care lags behind. It remains pretty hit or miss with only about a 30% chance of efficacy overall. There are new, relatively new diagnostic methods like genomic testing, but only one in four patients have actionable mutations to benefit from those therapies. And even if you are one of those one in four patients, uh, the therapies aren't guaranteed to work. So there's really still quite a lot of room for improvement in cancer screening and treatment and follow-up. And that's why I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Chris Apfel. He is a MD, PhD, and MBA, and a very highly educated guy. Uh, he's a physician, clinical researcher with over 100 published peer-reviewed papers, including a six-factor clinical prediction model published in the New England Journal of Medicine that led to the development of the Apfel score, which is a clinical calculator used in uh, universally. He kind of wrote the textbook on this to predict the risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting. That was his original area of focus. But he became interested in cancer diagnosis and treatment when his father was diagnosed with lung cancer. He had already lost his mother to ovarian cancer. And when his dad was diagnosed with lung cancer, he opted to forgo any therapy after having witnessed his wife really suffer from chemotherapy and just a, a sort of blunt instrument approach to treating her disease. And that drove Dr. Apfel to want to find more effective means of determining what treatments tumors would respond to and thus increasing the survival rates dramatically. So that, that really uh, initiated a, a new effort. He uh, left the clinical department at UCSF where he was, got an MBA from Wharton to complement his scientific education, and started Sage Medic, a new company dedicated to this kind of precision cancer testing and optimizing the therapeutic approach based on the specific characteristics of the tumor. So I really enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Apfel. I learned a lot. I wasn't familiar with this test. 
it it has the potential to be a game changer. Um, some of the most recent clinical data suggest it can roughly double uh, the chances of a successful outcome. And it's unlike any any other test that's available right now. So cancer continues to increase as a cause of death. I expect that will continue to be the case in the next several years. Um, and so it's more important than ever for us to have new tools to be able to increase our chances of overcoming it. So in this podcast, we, we talk about what the Sage Onco test is, how it works, what types of cancer it works for, how you can get the test if you have cancer, you or a, f- a friend or family member, uh, what, what drugs or treatments the Sage Onco test tests for, and some of the other new uh, innovations on the screening and treatment side in, in the cancer world that Dr. Apfel is excited about. Uh, like I said, I learned a ton in this interview. I'm really excited to be aware of these tools now to recommend in my network, and I hope you learn a lot as well. So without further delay, let's dive in. Dr. Apfel, uh, thank you for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I always love to start with um, just the guest's personal story and background. I came to this work through my own struggle with chronic illness and also watching a grandparent struggle with um, a heart attack and, and all the consequences of that. And I know you have your own personal story as well. So what, what got you interested in cancer research in the first place? Well, thank you very much for, for asking. I have a medical background. I studied medicine way back in Germany and, uh, and was very interested in clinical research. So I, my question was always, what improves patient outcomes? So I've studied, run a lot of clinical trials and um, published over 100 peer-reviewed papers um, and developed a clinical prediction model that um, is now a textbook knowledge in the field of anesthesia and perioperative care. So that's not oncology. And um, as a result of that, I basically got recruited to the U.S. And when a big paper came out on a 5,000 patient study we conducted in the New England Journal, uh, that we conducted in Europe and then was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I had some nice offers at the Cleveland Clinic, at Harvard and Stanford. And, and I chose the University of California in San Francisco because that's actually one of the premier institutions that are really thinking of how can we really have global health and improved health for everybody. It's a wonderful institution, and um, I continued my research there until my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer. And it was relatively clear. He said to me, well, unless you can promise me the therapy is going to work, I don't want it. And the background was that my mother has passed away from ovarian cancer. Uh, The conventional treatment, the chemotherapy basically destroyed her and made her miserable even into her last months of life. And it was actually only then that I realized even today, cancer treatment is largely hit or miss. We all like to believe the future is here now, but when one of your loved ones is affected, what you often realize is um, we are still living in the past. And that struck me. And so because I've also been an intensivist, And in the ICU, if somebody has a sepsis, so a serious infection that is in the blood, we usually take the specimen, a blood specimen, we cultivate the germs, and then we put antibiotics on it to understand which one is the most effective treatment. And you really need to see what works best uh, in order to understand uh, what you want to give to the patient. And you can't do this just with genomic testing because that's a very reductionistic approach. So the whole organism, like a bacterium, is basically more than the sum of its parts. And that's actually especially true in the field of cancer. And the idea that what's still current standard of care is you take a biopsy, it's thrown into formalin to preserve it, the tissue is then fixed and dead, And then you try to extract a molecule to predict which therapy would work had you kept this tissue alive and had you actually found it out. It's a very indirect method. It has an appeal of mechanisms uh, of certain molecular pathways. But in what way this is really relevant for that individual patient is not always clear. 
we call it, it's called precision medicine, and it has led to the development of wonderful targeted therapies that actually have shown effectiveness for some patients, but unfortunately only for a minority of patients. So unfortunately, according to the National Cancer Institute's MATCH trial, uh, the abbreviation for molecular analysis for therapeutic choice, according to that trial, only one out of four patients have so-called actionable mutations. So have genetic alterations for which we have drugs that are more likely to work than others. And what we often forget is even then the targeted therapy often doesn't work. So this reductionistic approach ignores that the whole cell and the whole tumor is much more than the sum of its parts. It's not just the DNA, it's also the DNA expression, it's a metabolomics, it's a proteomics, it's the extracellular matrix, it's the uh, microenvironment of the tumor that all affects whether this tumor will respond to a certain therapy or not. And you cannot, no matter how much AI you, you, you throw on this, you cannot predict this with genomic testing. So I was asking my oncologist, why can we not just take the patient specimen out, divide it up and test it in vitro to understand what would work best? And that's actually when my journey started. <laughs> <laughs> you said, go for it, right? And you did. So uh, before we talk a little bit more about what you developed uh, with the Sage Onco test, let's, let's linger a bit more on the standard model of care uh, for cancer. I, I believe from the statistics I've seen, you've, you've got, even in this era of, of precision medicine, you've got about a 30% chance of efficacy with, with treatment. And you also just highlighted some of the issues with the, you know focusing exclusively on genomic testing only one in four patients have actionable mutations that would even benefit from that therapy and then the therapy itself may not work even if you're one of those uh, lucky one in four patients so what are some other challenges right now that somebody who's diagnosed with cancer faces in uh in the standard of care and you know what are some of the the strengths of the, the standard of care that we can take with us forward into a, a new generation of cancer diagnostics. Yeah, I think what, what's really important is that if you have the diagnosis, you probably should take your life into your own hands. You cannot just rely on what's been established. More often than not, you actually have to do something. So. I, my first recommendation for anybody who has a diagnosis, assemble a support structure. You most likely don't have a medical background. All those technical terms are don't make sense to you. And the first time you hear this diagnosis, you are emotionally overwhelmed. Most of this you may not understand. And when you go home, you actually don't, most people don't remember exactly what was said. And it's emotionally extremely stressful. And my advice number one would be develop a support structure. Have your partner, have your friends with you and seek out patient advocacy groups because you need to actually basically understand what's going on to kind of navigate the system. So there are brochures on your disease. You need to know what type of cancer this is? Is there a certain subtype? What stage is, is it? What are the treatment options? And um, it reminds me of um, an advisor of, of ours, Dr. Arkel Giorgio, who has written a book on titled Healthcare Choices. And she also has a wonderful podcast, um, Speak Up For Your Health. And what she says is, you need to understand um, your condition, what are the alternatives of the treatment? What are the risks and what's the experience? And also understand that you, it's your body, it's your health. So you may actually prioritize, for example, quality of life versus longevity or minimally or maximal invasive interventions very differently than anybody else. It's your choice, it's your decision, and you want to be able to understand how can you navigate the healthcare system how can you communicate with your healthcare providers? 
what can they do, what can they not do. And this book also has very nice um, decision-making tools at, at the end. So think through this, assemble a support structure with patient advocates. And then there is one other thing that I actually would like to emphasize, get a second opinion. And it's actually a very interesting study by Dr. Snyderman and colleagues from the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center that actually has shown that uh, if you actually look at second opinions, they can improve a patient's outcome in roughly 23 to 57% of cases. It's actually a pretty powerful study. And so this would be the first step. Try to, to get your head around and try to understand it because most likely than not, if you want the best possible outcome, you, you want to be proactive and mindful about that. If you are in an early stage, you have a little melanoma or you have a little lump in the breast, very often with a surgical removal, you could be cured. So a chance to cut is a chance to cure, so to speak. In an early stage, stage one, cure rates are above 90%, 95%. We do exceptionally well in breast cancer. Actually, one of the exceptions for the U.S. healthcare system in breast cancer, we actually outperform other Western countries, <laughs> which is a surprise to me. Um, but it has to do with the aggressive screening. So if it's an early stage, you're most likely fine. Unfortunately, our system is not set up for early screening, even though there are now pan-cancer screening tests. They're not covered by insurance. People don't know about it. And so very often you get diagnosis stage three, stage four, and you really need to be searching for what you can do in order if you want your outcome to be better than the average. Yeah, I, I'm 100% in agreement with you. I've been uh, involved in, as a patient, as a clinician, as a family member of the healthcare system uh, for many, many years. And I've seen so many instances where people who were willing to uh, advocate for themselves or perhaps advocate for a family member had such a better outcome as a result of that, because as you pointed out, nobody knows what their priorities, you know, what a given person's priorities are better than themselves. And oftentimes in the healthcare interaction, assumptions are made by the clinician perhaps, you know, has a, a certain perspective or a certain bias towards treating a certain way, you know, being very aggressive, let's say, and the patient, that may not be how they want to approach it, but without informed consent or without, you know, seeking other opinions or without really understanding the full range of options, they just take that route because it's what the doctor suggested, even though it wasn't the best route in, in their particular situation. So um, definitely agree with that. Let, let's talk a little bit now about Sage Medic and the Onco test, and you know, going back to your uh, what your your father's oncologist said, or the question that you asked your father's oncologist, and and what what came of that. Right. So it was actually quite interesting because I also have a biostatistical background. I looked into the literature, trying to examine the biopsy, the fresh biopsy, and grow the tumor in vitro. That actually is not a new idea. That actually has been tried before 40 years ago. And interestingly, if you can actually grow the tumor, that's been kind of well established, and you put different drugs on it, you can actually say with roughly 80% what works best. One of the challenges why this has never become standard of care was that it is very hard to grow the tumors. Very often you may not have proliferative material in the biopsy. And actually in the majority of cases, those tumors, these ex vivo experiments didn't grow. So if they grow, then you can actually measure which drug is best to inhibit the growth. But if they are basically very slow growing or don't grow at all or get infected or die off, then you don't have a result. And so what we said is, there must be a way to have those results faster and not be dependent on the tumor growth because we don't just want to inhibit that it's growing and staying there we actually want to succeed we want to win this battle we want to basically kill the tumor we want a complete tumor response and we want long-term survival that's actually what i would want to have and so 
we developed a technique where we can actually get this biopsy shipped to us overnight. We create hundreds of microtumors within one day. They are similar to the original tumor. And then we drug them with often dozens of drugs to understand which drug or which drug combination is most effective in killing your cancer. And in the, with this approach, we have a result back for you and the oncologist within seven to 10 days in over 90% of cases. Wow. And, and we have some data that suggests this can double the patient's chance of a tumor response and significantly increase quality of life and survival. Amazing. So it, it's, the, it sounds like the innovation was around creating a plurality of, of the tumors at, rather than waiting for them to grow. You're doing a bunch of micro tumors and that allows you to do it much more quickly and not be dependent on the tumor growing as, as, as previous method uh, was focused on. Yes, that's one of the, the interesting things. I'm so excited to announce the latest product I formulated for my supplement line, Adapt Naturals. Luminous Mind is a blend of seven nootropic compounds that boost cognitive function and elevate mood, including phosphatidylserine, bacopa, ginkgo, lion's mane, and more. Nootropics are substances that improve focus, memory, and attention, boost motivation and mood, and promote emotional and psychological resilience. They also support brain health by protecting neurons, promoting neuroplasticity, and even regenerating new brain cells. I spent over two years researching, developing, and testing this product. One of our early testers described the experience of taking it as turning the lights back on. She felt clear-headed, focused, and alert, yet calm and grounded without the jitteriness or crashes of caffeine. She also said her mood was brighter and she felt uplifted and enlivened. This was the inspiration for calling it Luminous Mind. I designed this supplement for anyone who wants to boost their cognitive function, creativity, and mood, and support and protect their brain health. It's a perfect fit for students, knowledge workers, entrepreneurs, creators, artists, people under mental or emotional stress, and those struggling with cognitive issues, low mood, and difficulty focusing and concentrating. Think of it as an unfair advantage that can help you achieve your goals, whatever they may be. Visit adaptnaturals.com to learn more about Luminous Mind and place your first order. Are there particular types of tumors that you tend to have more success with in this approach and types of tumors that tend to be more difficult uh, or more resistant to this approach? So the beauty about our platform is that it is more or less tumor agnostic. So we can test triple negative breast cancers. We can test a colorectal cancer. We can look at liver metastasis just on a core needle biopsy. Um, I have a strong interest in ovarian cancer because my mother passed away from ovarian. So we do a lot in ovarian cancers. We have actually done stuff for glioblastoma. We also have done stuff for rare cancers or cancers of unknown origin. That's actually uh, where our platform is, is really thrives, in particular when this is a late stage, a metastatic or recurrent cancer, or this therapy has stopped working, then you don't want to wait until it's too late. You actually want to act now, get a biopsy, see where we can get a biopsy to have that shipped to us so that we can provide you with the options that are most likely to be effective for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk a little bit about those med uh, therapies. What, what kind of drugs? Are, are being tested and are you also testing combination of drugs, which of course some oncologists like, like to do? Yes, and so um, we have, what we normally do is the following. And, and let, me, let me also take one step back. If you are diagnosed and you are scheduled for surgery, that's actually the best opportunity to get a specimen to us. And you need to contact us ahead of time because otherwise the specimen is thrown into formalin and the tissue is dead and can no longer be tested. Right. So that needs to be arranged beforehand. And that way you don't need an extra biopsy and you have plenty of material for testing. So I give you one example. So let me walk you through ovarian cancer. There are, I would like to say, roughly five to 10 chemotherapies that are more or less standard of care. 
usually it's a duplet therapy. We test the, the single compounds as well as a combination. But there are also so-called PARP inhibitors. And these PARP inhibitors are often given for maintenance, especially when the patient is BRCA1 or 2 positive. And um, so we also take testing the PARP inhibitors. And, and then there are some of the drugs are often prodrugs. So we test um, these drugs that are the active metabolites in of that. And so we have the panel that is within the NCCN guidelines, number one. That's a, the first priority because oncologists primarily are sort of bound to work within a framework. And the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network, NCCN, has guidelines for oncologists which drugs to choose based on the tumor type or subtype. And so we test those first so that the oncologist can choose, I would like to say, can select the superior care within standard of care. Because then, then the, it's easier for the oncologist to implement it, number one. Number two, if there is a recurrence, we have an extended panel. That's these are usually another 12 panel drugs. But what we also do, and that's actually has recently come up, we also look at repurposed drugs. It's very interesting. There are drugs that are commonly used. Metformin is an example. Um, Desulfiram is an example where we have seen lovastatin, so statins. Um, there are repurposed drugs that are used for other purposes where your tumor may be very sensitive to. And that should not be a substitute. It should be an add-on. It should be integrated into your care to maximize the chance that you get actually a complete response. That's great, because I, I know uh, several oncologists who are using those repurposed drugs with great success. So it's great to hear that you test for them. So where does this test fit within like the healthcare system today in the United States, for example? Like if a, if a patient, cancer patient wants to get this test, does, does their oncologist need to order it? Can they request it through their oncologist? How would somebody go about getting it? Right. So it needs to be ordered by a physician. It could be your integrative oncologist. And uh, we would need to get a specimen to our lab. So if you are scheduled for surgery, you, you speak with the, um, either the surgeon or your GP or whoever is organizing this care. And that person can order the test. And then we will also communicate with the surgeon or the proceduralist how to get the specimen. Usually, one should also involve pathology. It depends. But it's ideal if the specimen is directly put during the surgery into the sterile tube, just to make sure that it's sterile. It needs to go through pathology anyway for regulatory purposes, but then that's the easiest way. Mm -hmm. The other way is, let's say you already had your surgery or you are late stage um, and you had already a biopsy. You already had the first and second line therapy and it's not working. You may have a lymph node that could be easily removed in your groin, in your axilla, or in, in, your, uh, in, near, in your neck. Or you may have some fluid collections. Ovarian cancer patients sometimes have so-called ascites, which is fluid collection in the belly. Uh, and that can be drained. And out of this drain, that's usually a routine of care, we can get the specimen. If you have something else, uh, let's say you have a glioblastoma, you may actually, and there is new compression, you may need a re-operation. That's another opportunity to get the specimen. Or if need be, you can have an exploratory procedure or a biopsy of a liver metastasis, and we can get those specimens as well. Okay, so multiple options there. What has been the response that you've received in the professional community? I know sometimes there's resistance to innovation uh, or skepticism. It seems to me that this is a, a very welcome innovation given what it uh, offers in terms of cancer diagnosis. But I'm just curious what, the, what, it, what that's been like. So it's exceptionally welcome and appreciated by surgeons, cancer surgeons, surgical oncologists, they understand the limitations 
Um, in particular, gynon surgeons know about these limitations of genomic testing. And because gynon surgeons in this country often also do the chemotherapy, and they often are then faced with these difficulties, what now? Um, they are more open to send tissue to you, and especially when we are talking about a later stage. The traditional, I would like to say, oncologists that are more, I would like to say, boxed into the standard treatment paradigms of genomic chemotherapy or genomic testing with target therapies or let's add some immunotherapy, um, they are usually very strongly minded towards what's covered by insurance and what's considered a standard of care. And if it's outside of this realm, a patient really needs to speak up for herself in order to, to get it done. And sometimes it requires that the patient is looking for a different oncologist. At the end of the day, it's, it's, your, it's your own life and you have to speak up for your health. Yes, this is what we were talking about before, being your own advocate. And I think that's true in so many areas of medicine, but particularly in cancer where the stakes are very high. And uh, it's important that people understand that there are these limitations. You know, I, I, I think most clinicians have a good heart and are, are doing it for the right reason, but they often are victims of the system as well. You know, they, they perhaps feel bound to a certain standard of care or they've just become accustomed to doing things in a certain way. There may be don't have time as much time as they should have to stay current with the research and and you know abreast of all the newest you know diagnostic procedures and treatments and and so as you said when it when it's your life that's at stake or the life of a, of a, of a family member it, it really pays off to be to ask a lot of questions and even be willing to step step outside of the the current model to to find the right path forward right and as you mentioned, stepping out of the current model, one, one thing that I would also recommend, and I think you, you'll probably like, like that comment, is consider an integrative oncologist. So I, for example, um, have had some contact with Dr. Lavelli, and um, he is an integrative oncologist who actually uh, has really a depth of expertise in terms of which repurposed drugs or alternative treatments can work through which pathway. Um, so I, I like him a lot. The other thing is may all major, I would like to say academic centers now have integrative oncologists. There is, for example, a very interesting talk from Dr. Lorenzo Cohen, who is at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he gave a talk at the Moffitt Cancer Center at some point. And he talked and quoted a study from, um, I think it was Dr. Barbara Anderson from Ohio State. And the title is something like psychological interventions or impact on psychological interventions on patients with breast cancer. And what she was doing is, I think she looked at over 200 patients, the randomized control trial. And she looked at over 200 patients who had a breast cancer surgery and lymph node resection. So it basically regional stage. And she was showing that with stress reduction, mood improvement, exercise, plant-based diet, and treatment adherence, she could double the chance um, of, um, or can reduce, could actually cut the risk of recurrence and death by half. So if that would be a drug, it would be a billion dollar drug. And okay, it's yeah. something that multiple, it would be the biggest blockbuster, but there is <laughs> stress reduction, exercise, plant-based diet, there is no money in it. There is no industry behind it. And so there is a lot you can do on your own uh, by thinking about what you can do for your own health to, to strengthen your immune system through exercise um, and to avoid junk food. If you think about that in, in infusion centers, um, very often they offer candies and, and other stuff that is high in glucose that cause glucose spikes. And we know that sugar loves glucose. The system is sometimes so <laughs> anachronistic. You need to put it into your own hands. Yeah, it's backwards. Uh, yeah, I had Dr. Lise Altschuler as a guest on my show. She's a 
professor of clinical medicine at University of Arizona uh, and is on the faculty of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. She's an integrative oncologist. And we, we, taught, we chatted a lot about these topics and there's so much um, that, that people can do and, and evidence-based interventions too. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, people who are entrenched in the dominant paradigm will, will just sort of scoff at these integrative interventions and, and claim that there's no evidence behind them, but that's not true. They're actually, the study you, you cited is one of many studies that support um, these diet and lifestyle interventions, especially, you know, and it's generally best to, to combine them with other, you know, standard methods of care and you get the best outcomes that way. But again, this, this really boils down to personal choice. Uh, we all have a right to choose what path we want to take based on our values and our worldview. And it's really important to know what the options are so that you can make an informed choice. Uh, Dr. Apfel, I wanted to ask you just before we finish up, any other medical innovations either on the diagnostic side or the therapeutic side that, that you're tracking right now that are promising for, for cancer care? Yeah, I think there are two. I would like to say there is there is screening. There is now a pan-cancer screening test from Grail. And um, if you think about that, we are currently screening for breast cancer, for colorectal cancer, for melanoma, perhaps, some of them, and then prostate, perhaps. And even there, PSA is not a good marker. There is now the gallery test that can actually detect a wide range of cancers at a much earlier stage. And if you keep in mind that if you're in stage one or stage two, your survival is 80%. If you're at stage three or four, your survival may be below 20%. So you really want to catch it early because the tumor actually is, takes about 10 to 20 years to grow, most tumors, not all of them. And so, so you really want to, if, if you are, let's say at my age, I'm now above 60, the, the chance that there would be something in my body that may become relevant in five to 10 years, that chance is already 5%. So I've made it for me, I'm paying out of pocket, and I'm doing this once every five years. I'm not paranoid about this every year. And then the other alternative is complement and alternate that within whole body MRI. Not going crazy on it, just looking, just checking. That's for early detection. And then there is the other part is, when you're, if you are diagnosed, if this treatment doesn't work or, or something like that, the, the, the number one, I think the next biggest Innovation is Sage Medics' ability to really understand which therapy can work best for your body or for your, can for your cancer, actually. And then once you have that and you have the selection, there is a liquid biopsy test um, from, for example, Cigna Terra um, or Personalis, where you can actually test for minimal residual disease. You can actually see whether now once you you have those treatment options, you can actually see how your body is responding to it and you can react much faster than with any imaging results. So those are the, I would like to say, the, the three main areas that I find interesting. Screening, early screening in asymptomatic people above 60 um, or if you have any other reason why your risk should be increased, that's one part. The second part is if you are diagnosed um, make sure a fresh specimen comes to SAGE. Do also be active in your lifestyle changes in exercise, nutrition, relaxation techniques. Consider integrative oncology. And then once you have your treatment, make sure you have your finger on the pulse, whether the treatment is working. And that's where the liquid biopsy comes in. Yeah. This has been fascinating. Uh, I'm really excited to learn about this test and be able to recommend it to you know patients and the providers in our network uh, where can people learn more about the tests dr atfall yes so it's at sagemedic.com sage is s a g e like the person you're talking to or <laughs> the plant <laughs> <laughs> uh, sagemedic.com not medical just one word sagemedic.com and um, there is also a phone number you can call 
and um, get further information. And I can also provide you with some other information on that provides you an overview of of, of what we are doing and our how our solution works. Great, and this would be a good resource if if a patient is interested in this test and their providers maybe not familiar with it, but open minded and, and willing to learn more. There's a right. section on the website for physicians. I see. Right. It might be best if if you, for example, contact us to kind of see where are you in your journey. Does it make sense? Right. And we could then help you to kind of figure out, can we get a specimen from somewhere? And when, then once you're armed with that information, then go to your oncologist or to your other physician to, to get it prescribed. And we can help you with that as well. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. Just minimize the, the friction and the number of steps and make it as easy as possible for them to, to buy in. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Apfel. I really enjoyed this conversation. I know that our listeners are going to be excited to learn about this um, and just increase the options, you know, and 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 increase the likelihood of, of surviving what can be a, a challenging and life-threatening diagnosis. So thank you for your, your work in this field. And thanks everyone for listening. Uh, send your questions to chrisgresser.com slash podcast question. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.